Welcome everyone. This is Braincast with Postpo for Monster Learning. One more week of lockdown and vaccination chaos behind us, behind us. I mean, who would have thought, right, that whole nations, you know, whole countries would be fighting over a vaccine, right? Well, we thought about it right here in one of the first Braincasts last May when we explored the ethics of the pandemics with Dr. Sridhar Venkatapuram, an associate professor in global health and philosophy. If you missed that or any of the other episodes, well, you know, don't worry, just head to YouTube to watch the video or Spotify to hear the audio. Yes, free, of course free, like, 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 like physical activity, it's free. You don't need a gym membership to exercise, so just go out there and follow Dr. Brendan Stapp's advice, our guest last week, when we discussed about the benefits of physical exercise on mental health. This week, though, we take a road that's well known, though not that well traveled, catatonia. No, not the music band. I mean, we could talk about the band too, though I have to say I'm not a big fan. With us, a Welcome Trust Clinical Training Fellow in the UCL Division of Psychiatry and a specialty registrar in general adult and old age psychiatry. He is the author of the Pocket Prescriber Psychiatry and a great example of how humble can great minds be. And to be honest, this is the only information he sent me about his biography. Despite having publications on the most highly cited journals, and despite being a leading figure worldwide in the world of catatonia, that's all he wrote about himself. Uh, I'm a registrar and I'm also a training fellow. Well, Braincast people, this is Dr. Jonathan Rogers. In fact, one of the people that set the spark for the whole series. Jonathan, welcome to Braincast. Thank you, Pospo. It's wonderful to be with you again. Fantastic. So, Jonathan, the truth is that the only reason you know, I'm doing these sessions is to spread the use of Greek language, because you will agree that catatonia is a Greek word. And so, of course, is atonic melancholia, which is indeed the way people were described in catatonia presentations before you know, Karl Baum and all the Germans took over. So, take us back in time. I want to hear all about the story behind catatonia. Yeah, so catatonia has been around probably forever. Um, and we've got accounts of it going back centuries. I think one of the most vivid, actually, is if you just transport yourself for a moment back to 19th century Vienna, okay, it's 1833. A physician, George Fendler, goes out to see a young woman who's developed some strange posturing. She's mute, she stops eating and drinking. He sees her over several days, and these were the days before the stethoscope, and he comes in one day, and there's no movement at all. He pronounces her dead. A funeral is held. She's buried. Now, this poor girl's one piece of luck is that her family decided to bury her in what was a really nice dress. And the grave digger thought, well, let's not let that to go, go to waste. So he comes back later that night, digs up the coffin, unearths it, and there is this girl alive. And, and that's one of the reasons why catatonia is, is sometimes called the, the Lazarus syndrome. These people who, who can appear dead from a psychiatric disorder and can actually are, are actually living, breathing and aware. Amazing. Unbelievable. I mean, wow. But you know what? What, what I find interesting about catatonia, I mean, it's many things, but it's the, the confusion. The confusion, you know, when trying to put it in a box. You know, is it is it a symptom? Is it a is it a syndrome? Can it stand on its own as a diagnosis, or does it always need to be you know accompanied by something else? Let's say catatonia with psychosis or catatonia with depression. So, what's the deal with catatonia? Yeah, I think uh, it's an important question, and it was confused for for much of the twentieth century by Kraepelin, who subsumed it into his idea of schizophrenia, and so we had catatonic schizophrenia. Um, but actually, increasingly, over the last 30 years, we recognize that catatonia can appear in many different disorders, um, affective disorders, um, psychotic disorders, and also organic disorders. So I think probably that 
my preferred way of thinking about it is as a final common pathway, um, a bit like delirium or heart failure. A patient having delirium doesn't tell you anything about the etiology, but it does tell you a little bit about how you might manage them. Similarly, heart failure, there are good treatments for heart failure, but we've no idea how, you might not have much idea how they got there. So uh, it, it, I, I, th I think it's probably best to consider it as a, as a syndrome that lots of different disorders can, can result in. And you know, it's not only one thing, right? While while most people link catatonia with 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 you know, mutism and posturing and people sending steel in eternity, the truth is that there are a few types of catatonia, among which you know the exact opposite, excited catatonia with prolonged periods of psychomotor agitation. Now, one of these types though is particularly interesting and potentially fatal malignant catatonia. Now, some people, among which catatonia experts like Fink and Taylor, they suggest that essentially malignant catatonia is neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So, so what do you think? Yeah, so this is controversial and there isn't universal agreement on it. Um, there is certainly evidence for substantial overlap in the symptoms. Um, so that the mutism, the stupor, the muscular rigidity that they all have in Colin. Um, and so Fink and Taylor would say that um, the only distinction is that um, NMS needs to be induced by an antipsychotic. But I mean, antipsychotics can induce benign catatonia in, or, or non-malignant catatonia occasionally. Um, so it's probably not a, a hard distinction. Um, and of course, NMS can be triggered by withdrawal of dopamine agonists as well. Um, the treatment is similar, um, so benzodiazepines and electroconvulsive therapy have been used for both catatonia and NMS, and there is this, this idea that dantrolene can be used for NMS, but I don't know about you, Pospo, I, I tend to have this idea that all our evidence in psychiatry is rubbish and all the other specialties have it right, but actually if you look at the, the evidence basis for treatment of NMS, it's really rubbish, um, and there isn't strong evidence for dantrolene. Um, so I think they do have a, certainly an awful lot in common. And, and you know, while traditionally, as we've you know mentioned a bit, it has been linked with uh, schizophrenia and depression, it is all the more recognised that catatonia can be part of other clinical entities. An earlier review by Jankovic, published in JNNP back in 2014, has a table named "Underlying Causes of Catatonia." other than schizophrenia and mood disorder in brackets. So now what I did, this is how I spent my whole weekend, I counted all of them, 54, from stroke to infections, from a wasp sting to cyberbullying. And while I'm pretty confident there won't be many people stung by wasps that would develop catatonia, there must be causes that are more common than others. Is that right? Yeah. Yes, definitely. And I think there are also causes that are probably triggers that are more potent than others. So an awful lot of people experience bullying um, and very, very small numbers of them develop catatonia. So I think probably we need to move to thinking of catatonia with a stress vulnerability model. So you have your, your underlying vulnerabilities, maybe a neurodevelopmental disorder um, or, 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 or chronic schizophrenia, and then you have a stressor. Um, so you mentioned a couple of these psychiatric causes and most commonly mood disorders, depression and mania, um, psychosis as well, schizophrenia. Um, Mark Oldham, who's a, a catatonia specialist on the other side of the Atlantic, has this mnemonic mindset for uh, remembering the organic causes of catatonia. So you've got M for metabolic. These are things like thyroid disorders, hypothyroidism, B12 and folate deficiency. Uh, I is for inflammation and infection, and particularly those disorders affecting the, the CNS, so um, herpes simplex uh, virus encephalitis, and NMDA receptor encephalitis lupus. And you've got N for neural injury or neurodegeneration, like Huntington's disease, traumatic brain disease. D, developmental disorders like autism. And S, structural CNS pathology, tumor, stroke, you mentioned. E, epilepsy, this is rare but really important. So catatonia can be a presentation of non-convulsive status epilepticus. And finally, T, toxins, I think actually one of the most common causes. So ketamine, wow. um, uh, steroids, and 
then, and then withdraw the benzodiazepine and clozapine. Well, I mean, pretty much everything, to be honest. And you know, I'm really glad that you mentioned, you know, autism, because, you know, there is this distinctively higher prevalence of catatonia in autism with some research reporting anything between 4 to 17%, and case reports suggesting self-injurious behavior in autism as part of anxiety catatonia. Now, the specific difficulty is that several of the catatonia signs can be also found in autism. Is that right? Absolutely. That there's a big overlap. So if you think of stereotypies, um, very common in autism, um, mannerisms, awkward postures, um, echolalia, and um, you get in, in autism, particularly there's learning disability as well. Um, and, and these are all features of catatonia as well. Um, so you, you do need to to, to, to be careful when, when diagnosing catatonia and autism. Um, and the, there are some more specific criteria and the, the lawn and wing criteria for catatonia and autism. Having said that, you're, you're right, it does seem to be common in autism and it appears to be a little bit tricky to treat. Um, importantly, what, what you're looking for is a drastic change from baseline. So if someone has always exhibited these features, it's probably not best formulated as catatonia. In terms of what's going on, I think probably um, uh, autism is one of those vulnerabilities. And often when you when you read the case histories of someone who's had autism and catatonia, it's not just the autism. They've had autism and then some incredibly stressful life event, or they've had a, a mood disorder on top of the autism, which has then resulted in the catatonia. And uh, possibly both of them are an expression of something else, something underlying. Um, genetics or maternal infection earlier on. Jonathan, trick, trick question time. So since catatonia, as you're suggesting, has such a diverse etiology that in many occasions, to be honest, it's really hard to desperate. And the truth is that, you know, it's not always linked to a mental health disorder. Is then catatonia the perfect argument for merging the mental capacity and the mental health act into one? Mm. Well, I think the most important point that you, you bring out here is that there are massive issues with mental capacity. And it's really important that these people are treated um, when, when they lack capacity to consent to treatment. Um, and sometimes you see patients who haven't been, had their physical health appropriately monitored, haven't been given the medications they need or the blood tests they need. And regardless of what legal framework we're using, and we need to be getting that right. Um, I, I've seen patients with catatonia treated under both the Mental Health Act and the Mental Capacity Act. Um, I think it's a bit context dependent. So if someone um, is already detained under the Mental Health Act, probably keep them there. Um, Sometimes if someone's just come into hospital with, um, uh, with uh, encephalitis, maybe it, the Mental Capacity Act is more appropriate. Um, it's an interesting point. You could merge the acts, but I think there are there are probably differences in how you want to deal with someone who's in del who's got delirium in hospital for three days and comorbid catatonia versus someone who's been detained with schizophrenia for six months. More rights that you might want to give someone who's in hospital for longer. And um, there's no reason why you can't put that in the same act. Of course, but enough with three questions. In the 2019 observational study by Mayara Espinola, 70% of patients with anti-NMDA encephalitis presented at some point with catatonic, 70%. And then, of course, you know, you've recently published an impossible to ignore review alongside Tom Pollack, Graham Blackman, and Prof. David called Catatonia and the Immune System. Tell us a bit more. Yes, yeah, so there were basically two inspirations behind that article. One was the fact you mentioned that um, some, some case series, as many as 80, 90 percent of people with NMDA receptor encephalitis, where these patients have antibodies to one of the postsynaptic glutamate receptors, um, have catatonia at some point in their illness. It's just a, an extraordinary, extraordinarily specific. Um, and then secondly, there was this finding that um, a few small studies um, have found low serum iron in catatonia. Um, now, iron isn't often a, a biomarker we use in psychiatry or even general medicine, but um, iron is very interesting because when you have an infection, 
your body sequesters iron, you reduce the level of iron in your blood. And the idea behind it is that this is an adaptive mechanism to deprive those nasty pathogens of the iron they might need to develop. So we describe iron as a negative acute phase market. It goes down during an infection. And so we thought, well, given this finding of encephalitis, given the iron, maybe there's a lot of um, inflammation going on in calcium. Maybe that's driving it. Uh, maybe it's, a, it's an extreme presentation of, uh, of, of systemic illness. Um, I, I'm going I'm to tell you this, tell you this privately, possibly, just, just between you and me. But um, uh, we've since tested this in, uh, in, in some local data. Um, and actually, we found that there, the, the white cell count in the CRP isn't massively raised in catatonia. Um, but we still have a large number of patients with antibodies to the NMDA receptor. And we've replicated this fire with finding the low serum iron. So uh, let me know if you have any ideas as to what's going on there. So, John, I will be thinking, and I promise I won't share this information with anyone else. But, you know, let's pause for a bit, because I would like to think about the subjective experience of being in a catatonic state. And I have to say that clinicians of the past were amazing, you know, when it came to describing symptoms and phenomenology in general. You know, what is striking, though, from case series, both by Kalbaum in the 1800s and August Hoch in the 20s, 20s, yes, in the 20s, is that they describe patients that they did not have recollection of what was happening during the catatonic state. So do we have any insight, you know, of the state of consciousness and the higher cognitive processes during catatonia? Mm. We do have some. So um, as you say, it's difficult because not everyone remembers. And maybe that's because we give lots of people high doses of benzodiazepines. Um, which are amnestic in themselves. Um, but of those people who do remember, a high proportion report fear or abject terror. Um, it's not universal though. And sometimes the catatonia seems to be uh, very directly driven by uh, a psychotic belief. So um, a patient says, um, I can't move because the queen of heaven told me the world would end if I moved. Um, I think the most important point for clinical practice is that we do have good evidence that at least a large number of patients with catatonia are, are aware during their episode. Um, and so it's very tempting when someone is stuporous and mute um, to treat them as if they're not there or as if they're, they're not interested in what you're saying. But actually, um, it's that compassion um, that someone might remember and, may, and is likely to be therapeutic for these people. So important point, man. I mean, one thing though that you know is pretty common in subjective experiences and descriptions, if you like, of catatonia throughout the years is fear. And in fact, most of it wrote a theoretical paper back in 2004 called Scared Stiff. Catatonia is an evolutionary based fear response, where, where basically what it does is it postulates that catatonia originally derived from ancestral encounters with carnivores whose predatory instincts were triggered by movement, but is now inappropriately expressed in very different modern threat situations. So what do you think? Mm. Yeah, I, I, think it's, I think it's a very interesting point. Um, at school, you're taught that the, the sympathetic response is uh, fight or flight, which, which is fine. Those are responses if you encounter a tiger. Um, but the third one, um, is freeze. Um, and you can imagine that's adaptive. Um, if, if you don't want to be noticed by a predator, um, staying absolutely still makes sense. And you do see this in animals. So there's uh, the, the possum, the, 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 the opossum playing possum, and you can induce it in rats, tonic immobility, and you can even selectively breed it so it becomes, uh, so rats are more likely to develop this. Um, so I think it could well serve a, an adaptive function in certain situations. Um, it's just much less adaptive in the in the rabbit caught in the headlights phenomenon, which I think lots of people with catatonia may find themselves in. Enough with theory, though, and let's get down to action. So, <clears throat> a 2011 paper by Pastel Seniors in the Journal of Affective Disorders is a review on the existing <laughs> rating scales for catatonia. By the way, there are two rating scales of catatonia with your name. Just saying, the Rogers and the modified Rogers catatonia scale. 
So, yeah. you're so when I was six months old, I, I wrote both of those, obviously, yeah. <laughs> so the authors of that review conclude that observation and psychiatric interview will not suffice to detect the catatonic syndrome since the most striking symptoms, such as posturing, are present only in a minority of the cases. Essentially, I mean, at least this is how I interpret it, urging clinicians to use rating scales when assessing catatonia. Is that so? Do we need to do that? I think what we do need to do is lay hands on our patients and physically examine them. Um, check for muscle tone, rigidity, Gegenhalten, Mitmachen, check for catalepsy, and um, in, in try to elicit echopraxia and echolalia. We do need to look for these things. Just uh, ask your patient how, that, how they feel in doing a a, a traditional catatonia, a, a traditional mental state examination, and um, probably isn't going to be enough. Um, I, I, I'm personally always a little bit reticent to say that you must use a rating scale because every disease specialist has half a dozen rating scales that they want you to use, and uh, we, we don't want to become tick box people. And, and actually, if you just try to diagnose catatonia according to a tick box, tick box, someone's mute, they're not responding. Um, and they're a bit rigid, well, that person could be in a coma. Um, you can't leave your psychiatric training at the door when you come to assess catatonia. However, what they are really useful for is um, monitoring severity and treatment mm -hmm. response. If you're going to give a trial of a treatment, um, it, it is so helpful um, to, to evaluate it if you've done some kind of score. And, and the most common one is, is the Bush-Francis catatonia rating scale. Do that before and then do it afterwards, and you've got a very objective idea of whether it's worked. Now, back in 2005, Van der Heiden published a really interesting paper called Catatonia, Disappeared or Underdiagnosed? So what they did is that they compared the frequency of catatonia as a diagnosis in the 80s and in the 90s, and they found that it dropped from 8% in the 80s to 1% in the 90s ascribing that mainly to poor diagnostic criteria. And I have to say that, you know, one of the main criticisms that psychiatry has faced over the years is that diagnosis is heavily reliant on clinical examination, making it a pretty subjective business, but also prone to mistakes and inaccuracies. So are there any biomarkers that could assist a diagnosis of catatonia? The most helpful investigation you can do for someone who's got catatonia is the lorazepam challenge. So that's where you'd monitor that, you'd come up with some rating of their catatonic symptoms, you give them a bolus of lorazepam, and then you assess afterwards. Um, and uh, it, it, a, a good response to that, A, helps you establish whether this is catatonia, B, it can help you elicit the underlying psychopathology, the psychosis of the depression may come out. Um, and uh, and it's very, very, very useful. There are some other biomarkers that are seen in catatonia. The low serum iron I mentioned, um, which is in about a third to a half of catatonic patients. And importantly, low iron in catatonia seems to be associated with an increased risk of developing neuroleptic malignant syndrome, which patients with catatonia are exquisitely susceptible to. Um, the second blood biomarker, which is common, is a raised creatine kinase. Um, and this may be because of the muscle rigidity. It may be because um, people are in one position so long. In terms of neuroimaging, um, there's nothing consistent yet, but I have very high hopes for uh, F-DOPA PET studies. F-DOPA PET studies. I, I doubt I'm going to be requesting for one anytime soon in the emergency department, but I'm really glad that you mentioned, you know, the benzodiazepines. I'm certainly not going to ask you to take us through the whole protocol. However, I can't help but note that, you know, although there is, you know, clear evidence for benzodiazepine efficacy, there is not really clear guidance for clinicians, and, and this leads to common mistakes, like, I don't know, like prematurely stopping or not adequately escalating the dose of benzos. So can you give us some tips for the next time we go in and treat someone with catatonia? I'd love to. It's one of my favourite questions. So um, uh, as you say, high doses of benzodiazepines are necessary and only withdraw them once the patient's catatonia has lies and then sometimes only do it gradually over at least a couple of weeks 
Um, the other problem frequently is when the benzodiazepines are prescribed is that they're sometimes not given because um, the patient looks, looks sedated or the patient isn't agitated. Um, so actually there needs to be really good MDT communication so that everyone knows this has been given for catatonia. Um, and and the, the last thing I'd say, the, the last uh, tips I'd have for, for lorazepam is um, give it about 30 minutes before meals to increase the chance of the patient eating. And finally, if you're giving it um, parenterally, um, the solvent that lorazepam is dissolved in is propylene glycol, um, which can at high doses cause uh, metabolic acidosis. So if you're using very high doses of parenteral lorazepam, check the anion gap and the pH. Really useful, really useful. And, and is there any role for antipsychotics? Yeah, again, controversial. Um, as I said, antipsychotics can occasionally trigger catatonia, and catatonia is a risk factor for neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So if you do use them, be cautious. Um, whenever you're treating catatonia, you want to treat the catatonia itself and the underlying disorder. And if you've got a psychotic disorder, sometimes you may, you, you may, you may need to use antipsychotics. But if you do do it, go slowly, be cautious, and provide some cover with benzodiazepines. And then, of course, there is ECT, electroconvulsive therapy. It was back in 1934 at the Royal Hungarian Psychiatric Institute in Budapest that Laszlo Meduna administered ECT for the first time in five patients with catatonic features, establishing ECT as a therapy not only for catatonia, but for a few other psychiatric conditions. So, Jonathan, when should ECT be considered for catatonia? Mm. Now, you know, as I do, that um, ECT often doesn't happen immediately. Um, so if a patient isn't responding to, um, to, to first-line benzodiazepine treatment within a day or two, I think it's helpful to start thinking whether ECT would be appropriate in this person. Um, because if you leave it three weeks after you've escalated your benzodiazepine treatment and the patient is getting sicker and sicker, well, it could be another week or so until the ECT happens, and the patient may be too sick to transfer for ECT. So at least start the workup very quickly for ECT. Get an ECG. If they need a CT head to rule out raised intracranial pressure, do that. Get, get things ready so ECT can be used early on. And, and what's the future of catatonia research, Jonathan? Word on the streets, word on the streets has it that you started a website. Is that so? That's right, yeah. Um, there's not very much information for clinicians about catatonia. So at the UCL Institute of Mental Health, we've now got a website. And we found actually, as far as I can see, there was no information at all for patients or relatives of people who have catatonia. Um, so we, we collaborated with some very helpful patient representatives um, to put together this information for patients. Um, my, my day job at the moment is cycling around London, trying to find people with catatonia and taking blood samples um, in order to investigate more of the uh, in inflammatory and neuroimmunological um, theories of catatonia. So uh, that, that's what I hope to do in the future. Amazing. Brainless people, Dr. Jonathan Rogers. Thank you so much, Jonathan. My German, I have to say, I'm still rusty, but my understanding of catatonia has certainly moved to the next level. And I hope yours out there too. Next week, we turn young. No, don't get too excited. Research on youth potions is still in its early stages, but we will be talking about children's mental health. With me, one of the most prolific child and adolescent mental health clinical researchers out there. With more than 16,000 citations, Dr. Tamsin Ford, a professor of child and adolescent psychiatry at the University of Cambridge. Until then, postpone and brain tests for monster learning, over and out. Mm -hmm.